before I get into Zulu, you have to understand what we're really thinking about. And when I say change, we're talking about a lot of things. And we've heard throughout today about pilots, lack of pilots, about how to train pilots, why to train pilots, and everything else. Uh, and I stepped out a few times, so I may have missed it. But some of the things that I didn't necessarily hear are where are the pilots, who are the pilots, why do they want to be pilots? You have to start and ask these questions. If you don't ask these questions, how do you know what you're going to do? First question I asked is, where do you live? How close are you to an airport? Everybody here says we need an airport to perform training. Why? Because we're trying to teach people to fly. How do you fly without an airport? It's an interesting question. But as we just heard Jeff talk about, there are different ways to fly. Now, do we do virtual flying? We can all debate that over a couple of beers later. I looked at Mobile. I live in Mobile, Alabama. It's on the Gulf Coast. It's not a big place. It's not a small place. It's about 500,000 all-in population in the larger metropolitan county area. Within that area, you can look at it and say, okay, well, we got a decent population. A bunch of those people want to be pilots. Well, how many airports do we have? We have probably about eight airports within a 25-mile radius of a point in Mobile, Baldwin County. Not a bad confluence. Now, we, we benefit, I think, like some places from Navy flight training. We're near Pensacola. Um, you actually can't throw a stone without hitting either a Navy training airport or a retired Navy training airport. Um, so we got a lot of airports in use or not in use around us. Now, 25 miles, you have to think, well, that's not too bad. I drive 25 miles to work every day. I'll drive 25 miles to the airport, not a big deal. But 25 miles, that depends on whether it says the crow flies or the road drives. So you got to think about that. 25 miles, if you're planning a trip, is not a bad distance to drive to the airport. I'm going to fly to see a Gator game next weekend. I'm going to be drive 25 miles to the airport to get in the airplane and go fly to Gainesville, Florida, or actually Jacksonville. That's not bad. We do that all day long because we'll do that to go to the main airport and get on a commercial flight. But think about it. We're talking about people that want to learn to fly. Is it a big deal to them that they have to drive anywhere from 25 to 50 miles out of their way at the end of a work day or at some other time period before work? on the weekend to get to their school. To me, it's a big deal. I have three young kids. Middle son wants me to coach football. Older daughter wants me to coach soccer. The youngest son just wants to see me. Sitting there at the end of a long work day thinking, oh, I'm supposed to go flying this afternoon. I've got to drive 25 miles out of my way to the airport and 50 miles home. Riley and Ryan want to see me. And it was a tough day at work. What do you do? Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird X-Wind SE and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulation.com. Com. Airport quality. Now think about this, and not a lot of us think about this, but there's, there's a lot of things, and I'll tell a couple of stories here in a minute. Airport quality. We all think of airports. Commercial airports, you drive up, big parking structures, big airplanes, all kinds of services in the terminals. You have industrial airports. My company is located on an industrial airport. Uh, we basically support a, an air, uh, a large aircraft maintenance center, my factory, and a few other side businesses, and lucky for us, the new Airbus factory that's coming in. But it's an industrial airport. You go by the county jail on the way into our airport. Not necessarily the nicest thing to see if you want to learn to fly. You then go by Papa Buddha's, which has been around since the airport was a military air base at World War II. Papa Buddha's is still open, and most of you can imagine, it's that bar that Jeff didn't show. Again, not the image that you want your 
your professional, your son, your daughter, your wife, or whoever's getting the training to necessarily drive by. You have the rural airport. Not bad. We have one of those. Uh, Fairhope, we manage a maintenance facility there. It's out in the country. It's beautiful. You know, cornfields, cotton fields, um, quail shooting, and everything else out around our airport. But it's in the middle of nowhere. And then sometimes combination of all of the above. You have to think, what is the image that the airport is projecting? What does that mean to your uh, prospective students? These are all important aspects. Now, how many of you have asked the other question? Who is your customer? And I think like Roger said earlier today, we don't say students, we say customer. It's very important. For those of you that fly behind the Continental Engine, you know that I am all about customer service. It is very important to me. I consider us good at customer service, but not great. And you ask any of my staff, I demoralize them daily saying we've got to be better at it. But you've got to understand who your customers are. Why do people want to fly? This is important. Well, why do you want to fly? For me, it had nothing to do. I don't have the passion. It wasn't something that I thought about. I was used to, from my earliest childhood, jumping in the car and driving four and five and six hours to go to SEC football games every Saturday, starting when I was knee-high to a grasshopper. So driving was no big deal. I was used to getting on commercial airplanes, all of that stuff. So why fly? I fly today predominantly because of my job. It is a highly convenient and effective way to get around very important to me. I fly for a hobby, or not hobby, but personal reasons. It's convenient to jump in the airplane and instead of driving six hours, fly an hour and a half from Mobile, Alabama to Gainesville, Florida for a football game. You buy a lot of time not spending six hours in the car each way. You can fly not as your personal business use, but you can make it your career or you can do it in the military. So there are a number of reasons to fly. But who are we targeting? Who do we care about? There's no doubt that we need new pilots for commercial aviation. But many of us, myself included, aren't necessarily looking at commercial aviation. We're looking at the broader general aviation. We're looking at people that want to fly because they need it for their business, their personal reason, or yes, even as a hobby, as a passion, as whatever. These are kind of the customers that I've looked at. Why? Because when you look at those customers, that's what we've been underserving. There are great flight academies all over the U.S., all over North America, and all over the world to teach people to be commercial pilots. And people sign up and pay big bucks for that. Welcome to the Aero News Network, the aviation world's most comprehensive news and information resource. Real-time, 24-7 online, audio, and video programming, where aviation has been getting updated for over a decade. Distributing over 11,000 stories, features, audio, and video programs every year, only ANN covers aviation and aerospace with this much depth, insight, and expertise. Check us out on the web at aero-news.net. When we formed Zulu, one of the first things we did before we did it in our market research, we called a lot of flight schools throughout the country, submitted emails. We got less than half back in response. Do we really want customers? Are we responding to the Lexus crowd? Are you answering what they need? Now, I also find it interesting in this industry, when you think about it, um, I flew in here last night on a Cirrus, and I'm, I'm pretty proud that uh, we power Cirrus, we power Cessna, we power Piper, and a bunch of others. We're proud of that. But I think about that, and that airplane, sold new, is up in the six, dollars $700,000 range. That's a lot of money. Now, anybody else fly in in a piston-powered airplane? Okay. Now, I know here at Skyport we're treated nice. How many of you flown into a place like PDK or, or Dallas Corporate or something else? Do they actually park you up in the front or under the cover, or do they send you out to the back 40? It's very interesting to me that you, this is an industry 
where we own a product or fly a product or rent a product, whatever the case may be, where you can fly into some place and if you had a car like that, you'd be pulling into a Lamborghini dealership. You'd be, you'd be driving a one-up. You'd be a picture that I see on Business Insider every day. This car spotted here in LA or this car spotted in New York. But here you've got customers that are flying hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of product and they're treated as second-class citizens. You have to embrace the fact that we're dealing with the Lexus crowd. And furthermore, the fact that we're flying that, which is a beautiful airplane, costs over 300,000 new, is a nice fancy product that takes a lot of skill and we as owners should not be embarrassed by it.